All right, for this video, I'm talking about cellular respiration, which is the uh, last main topic for learning target 2A. Now, um, I, I'm using the uh, provided slides again for this one, uh, but I did add in the, the questions that you guys need to answer directly before the response. That way you guys are very clear on what you should be writing down. So what we know is that living cells require energy in order to do work and we need to consume energy. Uh, we cannot, uh, we don't have the capabilities to create that energy on our own unlike plants. So here's just a picture of our cute panda that obtains energy uh, by eating plants. Now a common misconception is that plants do not do cellular respiration. Plants actually have the capability and, and have to do both photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So photosynthesis is to create that initial, um, basically to create the glucose, and then cellular respiration is to break that glucose up and use it as um, usable energy. We only have the capabilities to do um, cellular respiration. Okay, so here's what we are showing in this image. Um, photosynthesis is our top one happening in chloroplast, taking that light energy. Uh, whereas the cellular respiration is actually occurring in the mitochondria, and this is actually what releases ATP, which is our energy currency of the cell, and it also will release uh, heat energy. Once again, note that plants can do both of these processes. Okay, catabolic pathways, we talked about this a little bit last time. The breakdown of organic molecules is exergonic. One catabolic process is called fermentation. And fermentation is the um, degradation of sugars that can actually occur without oxygen. And we'll talk about this more in a little bit. Just note that fermentation is a catabolic process. Cellular respiration is the most prevalent and efficient catabolic pathway. You will probably be asked at some point whether uh, cellular respiration is catabolic or anabolic, so please know that it is catabolic. Uh, it consumes oxygen and organic molecules, such as glucose, and it will yield or give us ATP molecules, adenosine triphosphate. In order to do any sort of work, cells need ATP. So important, ATP is what powers pretty much everything in our, um, in our cells. So we have uh, redox reactions, and we talked about this a little bit as well. Uh, redox stands for uh, oxidation and reduction. Uh, catabolic pathways yield energy due to the transfer of electrons. Redox reactions transfer electrons from one reactant to another by either oxidation or reduction. So this is what I talked about last time. In oxidation, a substance loses electrons or is oxidized. So L, E, O, Leo. In reduction, a substance gains electrons or is reduced. It says GER, G, E, R. So please note those things. So here's one example of a redox reaction. The easiest way for us to uh, note this is going to be through this little plus or the minus. So we know that electrons have a negative charge. Um, so if we're losing electrons, we're losing that negative charge, which means it should become positive. So this one is oxidized because it's losing an electron. Whereas over here, we have a negative charge now, so that means that it must have gained electrons, which means it has been reduced. So this is our easiest tell is having our plus and our minuses. Uh, in our products there. However, some redox reactions don't completely exchange electrons. Uh, they can change the degree of electron sharing in covalent bonds. Uh, we'll have to talk about this a little bit more in class is my guess because um, most of you guys probably didn't do too much chemistry in middle school which would have been talking about our, our covalent bonds and understanding how to read all of these models. So we will need to discuss this uh, further in class. Um, but I guess you could look at this picture here and try and figure it out, see what is losing electrons here. Um, we take methane and 
it becomes carbon dioxide. Uh, we know, and it is losing electrons because it's being oxidized. Uh, whereas our oxygen that's becoming water is um, becoming reduced because it is gaining electrons. All right, so during cellular respiration, our glucose molecule, C6H12O6, is becoming oxidized. It's losing our electrons. And oxygen is becoming reduced, which is gaining electrons. Once again, this is another thing that you'll probably be um, asked about, and we can go more into depth uh, with this later in class. Okay, so here are our steps of cellular respiration. It oxidizes glucose. So overall, this is our um, equation for cellular respiration. C6H12O6 plus 6O2 becomes 6CO2 carbon dioxide plus 6H2O in energy. You'll note that this is just the opposite of photosynthesis. So what's actually happening? Glucose is becoming oxidized, but it's not as simple as this. It's happening in many, many different complex steps. Um, all right, let's see here. So electrons from organic compounds are usually first transferred to NADP, NAD+, which is a coenzyme. So what you'll see here, we have our hydrogen, and we have our electrons in H+, and that is going to become NADH. So we're taking NAD+, and it's becoming NADH. It's going to be important that you understand um, how electrons are transferred throughout all of this process, throughout the process of cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So one way to know that is it's happening in our NAD plus molecule because if we look here, we're adding in those two electrons, so it's going to actually be um, carried over. Um, we can also see that because we start with a positive uh, charge here, we end up with a neutral charge, and that's because of the addition of the enzymes, which have the negative charge to it. So NADH is the reduced form of NAD+, which passes the electrons to the electron transport chain. So if it asks, any questions ask kind of what is carrying or what is transporting our electrons, we would know that in cellular respiration it's NAD+. Okay, if electron transfer is not stepwise, a large release of energy occurs, as in the reaction of hydrogen and oxygen to form water. All right, the electron transport chain. We should already be a little familiar with the electron transport chain from photosynthesis and understand that what's happening in it is exactly what it sounds like. It is the electron transport chain. It passes electrons in a series of steps instead of one explosive reaction. So we're seeing consecutively um, those electrons being passed along the chain, and it uses energy from the electron transfer to form ATP. So that transfer of electrons help, it releases energy, and it will actually form ATP molecules. I'm going to go ahead and skip this one. So here's question 13. Can you outline the cellular respiration pathway? All right. Cellular respiration happens in three main stages. The first stage is glycolysis. Second one is citric acid cycle. And then finally, oxidative phosphorylation. So we're going to look at each of these three steps and see what happens in all of them. So starting with glycolysis. Glycolysis breaks down glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. Then, in the citric acid cycle, we complete the breakdown of glucose. Finally, in oxidative phosphorylation, uh, which is driven by the electron transport chain, where those electrons are being transferred from um, uh, one enzyme to the next, will actually generate ATP. So, glycolysis breaks down, glycolysis breaks down glucose, and we actually, um, we could figure that one out just from our root words here, glyco glucose, and lysis means to break down or split apart. So if you ever see something like hydrolysis, we're breaking apart uh, water molecules. 
citric acid cycle helps complete that. And finally, we'll have the electron transport chain, which brings it to oxidative phosphorylation. That's where we're actually generating ATP. So can you describe the stages of aerobic respiration? Basically, it's going to be the same thing here. Um, just knowing that if we're doing aerobic respiration, that there is oxygen. So here we have an overview of um, cellular respiration. I'm going to give you a minute to copy this down because this is very important. Okay, so in our overview of cellular respiration, our first of three major steps is going to be glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we are taking a glucose molecule and we're splitting it into two pyruvate molecules. This is happening in the cytosol, which is outside of the mitochondria. And we are going to release some ATP, however, not a ton. Also through this, we are going to have electrons that are going to be carried through NADH all the way over into our third step, which is oxidative phosphorylation. After glycolysis, our pyruvate molecules are going to move into the mitochondria where the citric acid cycle is going to occur, also releasing some ATP molecules and continuing to push electrons through NADH. Now also in this situation, we are having FADH2. So it's really important to understand that pretty much the sole purpose of NADH and FADH2 in cellular respiration is to act as an electron carrier. You won't need to know the specific steps of the citric acid cycle and glycolysis. You just need to know this, what's boxed in uh, yellow or orange there. Finally, in oxidative phosphorylation, uh, we have two major things that are occurring here, which is the ETC, the electron transport chain, and chemiosmosis, which are going to be considered a coupled reaction. And this is where we're releasing a majority of our ATP molecules is oxidative phosphorylation. Um, both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle can generate ATP through uh, substrate level phosphorylation. However, it is not going to be as much as our final step of cellular respiration. And this molecule, or I'm sorry, this uh, model is just showing how a phosphate molecule is getting added in through an enzyme uh, to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to become ATP, and our substrate becomes a different product. Okay, glycolysis. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, lysis is, means splitting, so we are splitting uh, the glucose molecule. It breaks down glucose into pyruvate, and it occurs in cytoplasm or cytosol as the cell. There are two major phases of glycolysis. The first part is the energy investment phase, in which we need to um, put ATP molecules into it before we get any energy out of it. So two ATP molecules are put into glycolysis, but then uh, we do transition into energy payoff phase, which we get four ATP molecules, and we get the formation of this 2-NADH, which is acting as, once again, our electron uh, carriers. So this is what's happening. Once again, this is our energy investment phase, which is this first part here. Um, this is a very simple version. This is actually what's occurring. So you can see it's incredibly complex, uh, this transition from ATP to ADP in this first part. Luckily, you do not need to know that. However, uh, what is important to understand is that we're starting with glucose, we're putting in two ATP molecules, and through a series of steps, we are getting our products out here. Then here's what's happening on the energy investment phase. Now we are getting our NAD plus and adding in our electrons to get an electron carrier. And we're taking our two ADP molecules here and here and turning them into two ATP molecules and most importantly, pyruvate. So once again, you don't need to know this or this. However, you have to understand the role of NAD plus, NADH, ADP, ATP, and the fact that we start with glucose and end with pyruvate.
Now we're moving into the second step of cellular respiration, which is the citric acid cycle, which uh, completes the energy yielding oxidation of organic molecules. So now this is happening in the mitochondria and it's actually in the matrix of the mitochondria. So it's the open space in the mitochondria. So before um, we can start the citric acid cycle, we have to take that pyruvate and we convert it into acetyl-CoA. Uh, this CO just means coenzyme A, uh, which links the cycle to, to glycolysis. So what this process is showing right here is that transition from being in uh, the first part of cellular respiration, glycolysis, ending with pyruvate in the cytosol, transitioning into the matrix of the mitochondria, and then turning it into acetyl-CoA. So in order to do that, here's what happens with our pyruvate um, molecule. The first thing, through a transport protein, that's how it's entering into the mitochondria, so that would be embedded in the uh, membrane of the mitochondria, we're going to go ahead and take this molecule, and this top portion, you can see that there's one carbon and two oxygen molecules. We are going to pull that off and release carbon dioxide. We then have another NAD becoming NADH, acting as an electron carrier. And now what we have left is this carbon, our CH3, and our uh, double-bonded oxygen. As it goes through the transport protein and into the mitochondria, the matrix of the mitochondria, coenzyme A is going to attach right here to form acetyl-CoA. Now if we were to zoom in on the citric acid cycle here, our second step of cellular respiration, this is what we have occurring. So now you'll see we're starting with acetyl-CoA instead of pyruvate. So this was our pyruvate transitioning to acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA is what's actually entering into the citric acid cycle. So glycolysis, glucose to pyruvate. In this transition right here, we have pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters into the citric acid cycle. We're gonna release carbon dioxide here. We are going to form more NADH. We're going to form ATP. And then next, we're using our second form of electron carriers, which is FAD, which becomes FADH2. The purpose of all of these electron carriers is to take it into oxidative phosphorylation, which is going to be used in the ETC. So, I imagine, here we go. Here's a closer look of what's actually occurring uh, in the citric acid cycle, but this is going to be way too complex for where we're at right now unless you have a really extensive background with uh, chemistry. All that's important out of this citric acid cycle, acetyl-CoA, releasing carbon dioxide, taking NAD+, creating NADH as an electron carrier, taking FAD, creating FADH2 as an electron carrier, and noting that it's a continuous cycle. Our products of this citric acid cycle are going to be ATP, or are going to be passed along into oxidative phosphorylation. That's where the major formation of ATP molecules is going to occur. So question number two asks, can you explain why oxidative phosphorylation is considered a coupled reaction? We talked about this in class, but a coupled reaction is basically when we're requiring the energy or products of one reaction in order to drive the second reaction. So as I talked about, oxidative phosphorylation is uh, made up of two major processes. So we have chemiosmosis, and that couples electron transport to ATP synthesis. So now we have those NADH and those FADH2s that were formed. NADH was formed in both glycolysis and in uh, the citric acid cycle, and FADH2 was just formed in the citric acid cycle. What's going to happen now is that that's going to donate its electrons to the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain then uses that to power ATP synthesis through oxidative phosphorylation. So this is where we get that coupling of a reaction. So in the electron transport chain, 
Now our electrons from NADH and FADH2 lose energy through several steps, and it's what's driving our whole reaction. So this would be a representation of uh, our electron transport chain. And at the end of the chain, electrons are going to be passed to oxygen, and that's going to form water, which is one of the products of cellular respiration. So here we can see that our NADH and our FADH2 are now going to donate those electrons, and we are now going to be uh, donating that energy, and that's why the free energy, if this is our uh, graph here, that's why our free energy is now decreasing. So now we have um, chemiosmosis, the energy coupling mechanism. So ATP synthase is what's actually going to be forming ATP. So we talked about this in photosynthesis because we also have ATP synthase, which is going to have a, um, a hydrogen gradient that's caused. And once those hydrogen molecules are brought back into the mitochondria here, through the um, through ATP synthase, this ADP and our lone phosphate molecules are going to combine to form adenosine triphosphate, which is our main goal out of cellular respiration. Uh, at certain steps along the electron transport chain, electron transfer causes um, protein complexes to pump hydrogen from the mitochondrial matrix to the inner membrane space, once again resulting in the hydrogen gradient, stores energy, drives chemiosmosis and ATP synthase, and is referred to as the proton motive force. That's uh, um, basically what I just explained. Okay, chemiosmosis is an energy coupling mechanism, so we're talking about the uh, coupled reaction again, that uses energy in the form of a hydrogen plus gradient across the membrane to drive cellular work. So it's coupled because of this hydrogen gradient. If the gradient wasn't formed, the entire uh, rest of our reaction would not occur. So here's another image of our electron transport chain. Um, what's happening here is now we are showing those electrons being donated back. So this first part is going to be the electron transport chain. Electron transport and pumping of protons, H+, out of uh, the mitochondria. And then chemiosmosis, which is ATP synthesis powered by the flow of hydrogen plus back into the membrane. So this right here is a perfect image of uh, a coupled reaction because electron transport chain, which is the same in photosynthesis, or same idea in photosynthesis and cellular respiration, we donate those electrons. So we go from NADH plus now, uh, we donate the electrons, FDH2 donates its electrons, through that donation, we are pushing hydrogen plus molecules outside of our um, outside of our mitochondrial membrane, creating this gradient. So the electron transport chain drives now this second reaction, which is ATP synthase, uh, also known as chemiosmosis, which is where we pull those hydrogen plus molecules back into the mitochondria, and through that we get the formation of ATP. This right here is a coupled reaction. So that's why oxidative phosphorylation is considered a coupled reaction because oxidative phosphorylation is a combination of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. Okay, so now how much ATP is being produced, where, and um, in comparison to how much we donate. So during respiration, most energy flows in the sequence, glucose to NADH to electron transport chain to proton motive force to ATP. Uh, this is exactly the process that we just looked at. There are three main processes in this metabolic enterprise. We have glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, what we're looking at at the bottom here is about how much ATP molecules are produced uh, per glucose that we donate. So in glycolysis, we get two ATP molecules out, and in citric acid cycle, we get 
uh, cycle, we get two ATP molecules. But note that they're formed through that substrate level phosphorylation, which is the picture I showed with the enzyme. Now, oxidative phosphorylation is really where we're getting a majority of our ATP molecules out, which is about 32 to 34 uh, ATP molecules. And this happens through that combination of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. So our total amount of glucose, or I'm sorry, ATP that is produced per glucose is 36 or uh, 38 molecules. Uh, about 40% of the energy in a glucose molecule is transferred to ATP uh, during cellular respiration, making approximately 38 ATP molecules. Now, can you compare and contrast anaerobic from aerobic respiration? So aerobic respiration is what we just covered with um, the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic respiration is going to occur when we do not have oxygen. And so that's called fermentation, which enables cells to produce ATP without the use of oxygen. So cellular respiration relies on oxygen to produce ATP. However, if there's no oxygen, we can still produce ATP through a process called fermentation. So let's look at those steps again. The first part of, of uh, cellular respiration is gly glycolysis. Glycolysis can produce ATP with or without oxygen. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter, it can be anaerobic or aerobic. It couples with fermentation to produce ATP. Fermentation uh, consists of glycolysis and then reactions that regenerate NAD+, which can be used for, um, which can be reused for glycolysis. In alcohol fermentation, pyruvate is converted into ethanol in two steps, which releases carbon dioxide. So pyruvate, remember in our um, aerobic conditions, pyruvate was converted into acetyl-CoA. During lactic acid fermentation, so right now we're looking at different types of fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation, pyruvate, is reduced directly to NADH to form lactate as a waste product. So here we have our two um, uh, mechanisms that can occur. So in this first one, we have alcohol fermentation. We have our glucose, and through glycolysis, uh, we are releasing our pyruvate. And here, we have glucose through glycolysis, releasing our two ATP molecules. And you can see that, and then finally releasing our lactate. Um, and in this top one for alcohol fermentation, we go from pyruvate um, to acetaldehyde, and then finally to ethanol. So in alcohol fermentation, instead of taking that glucose through glycolysis, pyruvate, and then on to acetyl-CoA, which would be for both of these, Instead, we take an alternative route to give us ethanol or lactate. And you can see that there's actually going to be two of each of those molecules. So basically, after glycolysis in anaerobic respiration, that process completely changes. So instead of going into the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, that cycle changes and becomes fermentation. Both fermentation and cellular respiration use glycolysis to oxidize glucose and organic fuels to pyruvate. We can see that right here. Um, that's exactly what we were just talking about. So fermentation and cellular respiration are going to have different final electron acceptors. And cellular respiration, as you can see, produces much more ATP than fermentation does. Uh, so one thing to note about pyruvate is that it is really important in uh, catabolism. So as you can see here, we're taking our glucose molecule and we're showing the two different paths. So both of these are not going to happen at the same time. It's one or the other. So let's say we're going to take the aerobic respiration route. Our glucose will become pyruvate. And if oxygen is present, aerobic respiration, we become acetyl-CoA to go through the citric acid cycle onto oxidative phosphorylation. If there's no oxygen present, we're going the anaerobic route 
we still become pyruvate. So it's important to know this still happens. So glycolysis, glucose to pyruvate, anaerobic respiration, where we become ethanol or lactate, depending on which type of fermentation it is. Glycolysis occurs in nearly all organisms and probably evolved in ancient prokaryotes before there was oxygen in the atmosphere. So now we're bringing back topics from uh, Learning Target 1, where we were looking at conserved uh, processes throughout uh, all of time, and glycolysis was one of them. So this process right here has been around since probably some of the earliest prokaryotes on Earth. And that happened before oxygen, which means that what was happening was this uh, anaerobic respiration. Glycolysis and the citric acid cycle connect to many other metabolic pathways. Uh, so catabolic pathways funnel electrons from many kinds of organic molecules into cellular respiration. So here we have um, our three main food groups, actually, that we're going to eat. So we have our proteins, our carbohydrates, and our fats. Now what we've talked about, and you should have talked about in middle school, is what are all the subgroups of these three um, types of food. So we know that proteins should break down, or do break down, into amino acids. Carbohydrates break down into simple sugars. And fats can break down into glycerol or fatty acids. So what this mo uh, model is showing us is where all of these things, uh, where these subunits are going to be important in our process of cellular respiration. So our sugars are what starts the process of cellular respiration because glycolysis breaks down those glucose molecules. However, our fats and our proteins are still important because they're going to add in later on in cellular respiration. But it's really important to understand that uh, our simple sugars, our carbs, are what gets glycolysis going. We know this. The body uses small molecules to build other substances. Uh, these small molecules may come directly from food or through glycolysis or the citric acid cycle. And I think this is where I wanted to stop. Yep. Um, yeah, we don't need to actually do these last two slides, so we'll end here uh, for this learning target.